This is Rough City Podcast with Keith and Chaz, episode two. Better sounding, new and improved, hopefully. Rough City. Keith, check your mic. Mic check, one, two. All right. I think this will be a little bit more audible. First thing I want to say is thanks, everybody, for listening to episode one. Um, Thanks for the response, everyone who subscribed to the YouTube channel and uh, all the listeners who replied and responded to last episode. You guys rock. And uh, we are going to get to those listener reviews of last week's recommendation, which was the new Tool album. And we're going to read those later in the show, as well as go over their album recommendations. Before we get into that, let's talk about what this episode is going to be a little bit about. Firstly, we're going to be talking about concert experiences. What was your first concert? What was your first metal concert? Because I believe that's two different questions that deserve its own story, right? Oh, for sure. It's like your your first concert could almost be anything, and it's forgivable because it's so innocent. Ah, mine was New Kids on the Block. Ah, that's cool at an arena. Awesome. But <laughs> then your metal concert <laughs> is like a rite of passage thing. So oh, we're going to yeah. get into that. And then after that, <clears throat> we're going to talk funny concert experiences and overall memorable concert experiences. Then we're going to get into Keith's band Roland's new album. I want to hear a little bit about how that's going. Uh, after that, we'll get right into listener reviews and recommendations. Sound good? That sounds good to me. All right. But before we get started, I just want to say, you know, while I was editing last week's episode, I feel like I was I cut you off at a moment when you were starting to talk about your depression. Do you want to elaborate or now that I just put you on the spot like a dick? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, it's funny you should mention that because uh, that's why uh, it's probably why I'm tired all the time. Uh, I woke up this morning and all I wanted to do is go back to sleep. So I did. And then I went to work. Not bad. But this is one of those things that, you know, a lot of people deal with. It's manageable. It's not one of those, you know, it's it's not as, eh, it's fine. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> oh, I'm not worried. I was just asking. <laughs> we, we, I deal with it, man. I think at one time I did have borderline clinical depression, maybe. But, uh, you know, I just, all I can say for advice is uh, drink. No, <laughs> that's terrible. Well, no, I just, uh, well, I got some goals, though. Like, I, you know, I, um, I've gotten into a habit of, you know, just, staying in bed and watching YouTube videos and being kind of sedentary a little too much, not exercising very much, just being lazy. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm starting to get into working my way out of that because it's a very comfortable state of being, but after a while it just doesn't feel good. So for example, I'm going to try to get, get up early more regularly. I'm going to try to practice more. I'm going to try to ride my bike more because I really don't exercise. That's a that has a lot to do with why I'm tired all the time. That is I true. Start, I need to start running, walking. Um, yeah, get into shape, dude. I mean, you can't yeah. really be depressed when you're tired. No, you can't. When you're moving around, it it actually helps the brain as well. And um, on top of that, you know, I mean, I, I keep busy as well. I, aside from work, I'm still doing music things, so. I just got to get basically what it comes down to is exercise. That's really what I have to start pushing towards. And I, that'll help a lot. But other get, than that, I'm usually get busy just, living or get busy dying. As he's saying Shawshank. That, I love that movie. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, 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 part, go ahead, I remember, so. yeah, I know that was, do you remember that part where he had to like crawl through a river of shit? Oh, of course. And the music yeah. was gorgeous. That was the best. <laughs> Even when I was a kid, I was like, dude, this music's epic, man. Yeah. Like, when I first saw that movie, I was like, this is the best music for this scene. Uh, For some reason, it was just like, it made the scene so much more intense. And when he got out of the, when he got out of the, like, the tunnel, and he was, like, finally free from prison, it was like, that was, like, one of the most epic moments. I just watched that with the commentary, director's commentary. It was really fascinating. But, uh, anyway, I just want to check on your depression. Like I said, drink. You're going to hear some of the ice rattling as, as usual. I'm, I uh, am uh, partaking tonight. I, it's, I'm expecting it. I'm expecting some ice to be rattling around. Um, 
I had this funny story real quick. I'm um, talking about depression a couple of years ago. I was staying with my mom at this old house and uh, you know, she, she's seen that I'm sort of a shut in. I just wouldn't go out that much if I would just bring a bottle home, which is really kind of dangerous when you start bringing alcohol home and just drinking at home. At least when you're at the bar, your budget is limited and you kind of tap out and you're like, I can't spend a fortune. But when you start bringing it home and getting comfortable drinking, that's bad. And that's where I was at. But uh, I remember this one night I was telling her, I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to go out tonight over to the local bar. She's like, cool. And she had a couple of glasses of wine herself. And I decided to just stay in instead, just got a bottle and came home. And she comes down the hall and she's like, I thought you were going to go out tonight. I was like, eh, I just decided to stay home. And she goes, she goes, you're just going to rot. And turned around. <laughs> And turned around and walked away. Best response ever. That is smiling so sweetly. It was almost a compliment. You're just gonna rot. <laughs> oh man. That's, I, don't, that I, don't me up. I don't know if that's the best thing or the worst thing to hear from <laughs> Oh, it made me laugh so hard. It's still funny. Uh, All right, well cool. Let's move on to the first topic, which is your first concert and uh how about we do this? We'll go back and forth. I'd like to start and then we'll go to your first concert. Then we'll jump back for me from my first metal show back to you and so forth. Sound good. That sounds good. So my first concert was shit, maybe 1996. I want to say maybe 95 Panama city, Florida. I was 14 years old and it was at club La Vila and, uh, which is self-proclaimed largest nightclub in America. I don't know, every fucking big nightclub says that, I think. But they're pretty big. Typo Negative, which was really a fun fucking experience because I remember that summer, the band was introduced to me because me and my sister went with our friend who, uh, our friend Josh, who showed us the band. We had never really heard it, but he showed us everything about Typo. And then they happened to come into town that summer, right at when we were like, diehard fans of it so it was pretty awesome an experience and uh typo negative i don't know if you've heard there they're you know who peter Steele is i'm sure you've heard the name they're, they've, he's been around he's dead now oh, yeah yeah he uh uh i remember getting into them a little bit when i was in uh middle school and i was like this guy's got the deepest voice ever it's Chris Day. Yeah. yeah yeah like goth industrial and uh we were front row going fucking bananas and uh, i'll never forget he was chugging everclear which could very easily be filled up with water in the bottle you know <laughs> For, but i believe he was it was everclear because of where he is today which is dead <laughs> and he at the, end, at the end of like the very last song which is black number one boy you can't get any more goth band than that sitting there singing about hair dye black black number one you dyed it black it's like oh come on guys <laughs> yeah man yeah. I I don't care. Awesome. uh but he, he at the very last song he played the last note and then started rings off with his bare hands just one he's hand a, <sighs> he's, a, he's also a big ass dude like dude huge yeah he kind of looked like and he always had that like super pissed off look in his face, even during interviews. It was funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my first show, for our first concert. Not bad. That's pretty sick. I didn't even I didn't know that that was your first show. That was that's yeah. happened. That's crazy because yeah, they were. Uh, I mean, uh, here's what I'm curious about. Do you remember like how it sounded in general, like? Were they playing lots of like the old stuff where it was kind of like, Oh, it was, it was like a fucking best of, of everything me and my sister had just been shown. It was like, like, dude, remember the pound, anyone who lived in San Francisco in a certain era that was into metal, there was this place called the pound. All you had to see, all, this is how you say it to local fellow local San Francisco. You go, dude, the pound, the pound, kind of like pizza bagels. It's yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was this little shoebox, hottest fucking hottest room you could ever tolerate. Oh yeah, like an oven of funk. But what was great about that place? 
what what metal band are you into? Which album are you into this month? Don't worry, they'll they'll surely be at the pound next month. It seemed to be like that, like a fucking rotating door of everything hot in metal, and we got to see and meet so many of our heroes because of that little place. Because you you can't get backstage at the at Slims or the you know the Fillmore like you can. You could at the pound. You literally just step over a fucking chain and the bouncers don't give a fuck. I would just put my hair down and look generally pissed like Peter Steele at all <laughs> times. And they thought I was part of the crew or something. I just I'd meet all these Swedish guys. But uh, yeah, uh, how did I get to the pound? What was your question? <laughs> I, oh, I no, you pretty much answered it. You, it, it was uh, you were just saying that they played all the like. Oh, hits. right. All the hits that we had just learned, it was perfect timing. So it was like seeing our favorite band all of a sudden front row. And it sounded great. It was really awesome. You know, and I've been to many because my both my parents are professional musicians. My mom was in the army band. My dad was in the orchestra pit. They're jazz musicians as well. So I had been to, you know, live music my whole life and concerts as far as band, big band, concert band. Sure. But this was a show, my first show. When I say first concert, clearly that's what I mean, So yeah that's sick do you uh, would you ha- do you happen to remember who like the opening bands were or was it there was one band i remember and i can't even believe i remember their name because it was so fucking goth and it's called mnso4 oh i've heard of mnso4 really then maybe oh, wow all right i think that was that show fuck but you know it was just a bunch of industrial stuff i don't know uh, anyway what was your first concert Mine was, um, well, as far back as I can remember, my first rock concert was, I think it was, okay, so when I was in middle school, I was really good friends with this kid, Ben. We used to be in a silver chair cover band, and we started, you know, we, we all liked the same music, you know, so we, we ended up hanging out and bonding over, like, all these rock albums from the 90s and stuff. And then uh, I remember it was him and his dad and then me. I I was basically invited. Like, he was like, dude, let's go see Metallica. I was like, okay. So uh, I drove up with him and his dad, and we drove to Candlestick Park, which actually it's in San Francisco, but it's not there anymore. They they tore it down recently. But uh, back in the 90s, it was Candlestick Park. And it was Metallica headlining, of course. What? Your first concert? Oh, my God. Yeah, it was Summer Sanitarium Tour is what it was called. And it was, it was, uh, uh, it's kind of a funny lineup. We're looking back. It was Metallica headlining, of course. And then it was Korn. And then it was Kid Rock. And then it was Power Man 5000. <laughs> wow. I love it how you were like, wow, typo negative, your first concert. And then you're all like, uh huh. And you have this answer uh, it was it was a big yeah it was huge and and i remember like we got there and of course you know it was like my first time at candlestick and it was packed filled with people we're talking thousands because it's metallica but when we got there paramount 5000 just ended and i was never really into that band they were one of those weird sort of like four on the floor rock bands and then i was never a big fan of kid rock but what i do remember is that he had like pole dancers on either side of the stage and they would just dance around. And there was one point where he basically ran around stage and like played all the instruments. Like he even went behind the drum set and did a little drum solo and like played guitar and then piano. And then he like went back to the front of the stage and did, his, you know, went back to just singing. I thought that was kind of entertaining. And then I was a big corn fan at the time. I still am. Uh, but back then, both me and my friend Ben were huge fans of that band and we saw them and it was like my first time seeing them, but they were actually weren't that great. Like I remember Jonathan Davis was like, he looked like he'd just woken up and (laughs) they were kind of having a tough time. I mean, they got through the set and they played pretty well. It was exciting to see them regardless, but are you sure that just wasn't his stage presence? (laughs) Well, I don't know. I just woke up, man. That might, maybe they were just, big into drugs back then because <laughs> i've seen corn awesome. like i've actually seen corn like four times since then and all those other times they're like flawless live including jonathan davis 
So um, I don't know. Maybe it was just a bad show uh, on, on that tour that they were on. But then Metallica went on stage, and that's, you know, it was already nighttime at this point. And it was just super epic, man. Huge sound. They played all the hits. I remember there was a lady, an older, like, biker lady who was, like, who was, like, uh, on top of the, on the shoulders of, like, her boyfriend or, or whatever. And she, like, took her top off and was just flailing around. Yeah. And I, and I turned to my right, and I look up, and I just see, like, this huge pair of, like, biker lady tits. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm, like, this, like, little. Oh, you know, my like, stars. Like, I'm like this nerdy little like middle school kid, like, oh my god, what what kind of a this is cr- this is awesome. <laughs> it was crazy. And then uh uh so that was it, man. That was my first like big rock concert was actually Metallica, which is kind of dude, you got it's Metallica. Kind of cliche, it's kind of cliche, but but yeah, that was what started it, man. Metallica, corn and titties. Mine sounded like a Jonas Brothers show. <laughs> no, dude, uh, uh, uh Type of negative gets heavy though. I remember their old stuff. Oh, it was heavy, but it ain't no titties heavy. <laughs> yeah, I fucked it up. All right. <laughs> well, that's pretty good, uh, man. Well, your metal, your you almost have both questions in one answer. Uh, first metal concert, but I'm sure you've got a good, a good first like metal concert story too. So let's let's jump back to to mine. First of all, Keith Keith wins that round. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, pretty. That's a good concert. So, all right, first metal concert for me. Now, this is a funny story because, like, uh, I was a late bloomer on metal for one. Uh, all yeah. of my friends in San Francisco were all metalheads, and I wasn't. I was sort of the you know I was a musician, so I you know got into the crew. <clears throat> we all liked each other, but I would be the prick in the back. I was like sixteen. Anytime anyone put on metal, I'd like turn that shit off. I was a jazz musician. I was all fucking snobby, fucking jazz musician. That's all you got to say. You know, I really didn't. You know, it came from my dad. Honestly, he never embraced the heavy metal. Of course, he in his time when he was younger, he liked the start of heavy metal. He loved Hendrix. He loved fucking Zeppelin. Of course, he loved Skinner. But uh, he got into jazz, and I got into jazz. And I think maybe it was just that whole not following you know not continuing to follow my parents through the jazz and c- going on my own rebelling into metal that he never grabbed it so uh mm. i don't know I, I don't know where i was going with that was it, anyway. well i mean oh, you- that's what it was. i was i was heavy into jazz but i sort of was surrounded by friends who were into metal and they were trying to convince i even remember them saying dude if you did get into metal jazz, you have no idea, man, because they appreciated my other music tastes and we could talk music always, all, all of my friends, but they'd be like, God, what is, what are you not hearing? I'm like, dude, it's just noise. It's just noise. Like anyone, honestly, like anyone would naturally say who's not into metal. I can't subject like some old couple next to me. I'm, you know, busting out in flames. What the fuck's wrong with you people? This is music. Like I sure felt like that at one time, but, Sure. But basically, I was peer pressured into metal, and it sounds stupid. But hey, I was 16, and I would finally. Uh, everybody was planning to go to uh, see Slayer. Oh, so I'm like, all right, I don't want to just not be. I, I had nothing to do. I didn't want to leave the, the group. So everybody got tickets, and I got a ticket. I'm like, I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna go check it out because I'm going with the guys. So uh, that was my first metal experience, and I experienced it from the very back of the room, nowhere near people going nuts. <laughs> of course, all okay. of us just disappeared into the front, into the mosh pit, and you know they were ready to die for Slayer. I say in the back. That's probably a good thing because um, Slayer shows are they're known for having really brutal like mosh pits and you can actually get really hurt in them. So it's probably good that you stayed away for your first metal concert. Well, let me finish the story. Cause this is how pathetic I really am. Uh, I, I, so I, I've definitely experienced, I remember experiencing the show and I remember every bit of it. It was a great stage show, great lighting, sounded great. 
even though I wasn't a fan of metal and I wasn't a fan of any of the music, I, you know, I was getting Slayer to the face. So I do remember being in awe of it, the power of it and observing the crowd. But I'll never forget when the show was over, I, I just stand there waiting that you know, all the people start spilling out to leave from the stage. And then suddenly here comes my friends all just drenched with sweat and bruised and fucking exhausted. And they look at me, I'm like, Oh, Hey guys. And, I, and one of them just starts busting out laughing. Like, look at Chad, this fucking dry as a bone. And my hair was really long and blonde. It was just this perfect poof of dry hair. Like I, it, they just gave me so much shit and made fun of me because I, I didn't have a drop of sweat on me at a Slater show. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm like, all right, well, whatever. I was used to being laughed at in the group anyway. So it, great show, funny experience. And before, I'm not going to go into a whole other story, but let me just say, just to uh, accentuate on how pathetic I was. And <laughs> one, <laughs> the, the second metal show I went to was Sepultura, again with the guys at Maritime Hall in San Francisco. Again, phenomenal show. Uh, it was the first show without uh, Max on vocals, so it was sort of interesting to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Uh, but it was still a great show. But here's pathetic me, not wanting to get made fun of again. Again, I watched the whole show from the back, safe. All my friends are up front. But I, I had saved a little bit of water in a water bottle. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you serious? <laughs> so that I would, right when the show's over, I would dump it on my head and look like, uh, and that's exactly what I did. And I'm like, eh. and I find the guys and they come to me. I'm like, eh, guys. And I, the same guy it was probably Jim looked at me and goes, what the fuck? Did Chaz just dump some water on his head? <laughs> and they all start laughing at me again. And I'm just sitting there like, man, fuck y'all. That's hilarious. <laughs> I like how you tried to fit in, but whoever it was, Jim or whoever, totally knew that you were just bullshitting. I don't know how they knew. Probably just the the sincere look of, hey, guys. (laughs) Hey, guys, I had so much fun. (laughs) Can you you tell? Totally true. (laughs) So, yeah, that was was my first, like, metal show of many. That is ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Well, you know, I'll tell you what. I've had a lot of, um, you know, ever since that Metallica concert, which I think was like, I think that was like 90, I want to say that was like 1998, maybe. Um, since then, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I started going to all these metal shows because I really got into the music. And um, one of my, I, I can also actually bring up the first metal show that I ever went to, The Pound, uh, was, was a really great show as well. Um, it was... Uh, Soylent Green uh, from Louisiana played, and I was a big fan of them at the time. And yeah. Cephalic Carnage, which is like this weird sort of wacky death metal band. And then um, who else was there? Well, those are the two main bands. Oh, I think Dark Funeral was there, this, this like black metal band. And I remember I was blown away because I, I, I got to go right up to the front of the stage and watch Soylent Green play. And I knew all the songs, and it was just so loud and heavy. And I remember that it, that experience it stuck with me because I was just so stoked to hear this band. And, like, I was just so excited. Like, oh, man, they're playing this song, that song. It was it was different than Metallica in the sense that it was a little bit more intimate of a, an experience because I was right in front of them, you know? Yeah. But... That was my first, and of course, you and I, you know, you talked about the pound earlier. Since that show, I, you know, I had gone to the pound to see metal concerts at least, I don't know, two dozen, three dozen times, including when the Lissinger played there, which is, you know, our old band. That was also amazing. A lot of history. Yeah, our first, old our pound. first uh, couple of experiences to pound were, uh, you know what's the word for it not as you know it's it we had to, it it got there eventually it took some um we had to prove ourselves mm, it was oh, sort of that little bit of that vibe of like what you have in LA 
since forever and probably still now where you have to prove yourself um, to the venue, not only for draw, but performance. And the pound was awesome because they actually judged us. They judged us on performance, I think, more so than draw. And they gave us, they really gave us a shot. So whoever was in charge of, what was it? Insipid Productions. Whoever was in, sar- in charge of booking who booked everybody, all of our fucking heroes. And it was like, it was really the saddest thing in the world for our old band because uh, when we finally got that ticket, the guys, I rem- I'll never forget, who, who do we, we opened for somebody. I think it was, uh, not him, it was before that. It was, uh, it was like a, Dark Tranquility. I thought, no, well, we got the Dark Tranquility show, which was our first huge show and, and you know, one of the best experiences of my life for sure in memories. But that was sort of a fluke, I think. But they, they gave us a shot because they needed someone. I don't know. We really got lucky on that. But after that, we had to do another battle of the bands there to sort of, again, try to get their attention. And i never forget when Micah came up to me, our singer, and he comes up to me and goes, dude, the guy from Insipid just said, I listened to you guys tonight. You guys nailed it. You guys let me know. Look at our calendar. Any band you see, you let me know. You got it. With those words exactly from the mouth of the guy, like we were in one show after that, the pound closed. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. It's so, such a bummer. And, and Insipid, I guess they stopped doing shows or something. Because they, they, the, they had the fucking, they had the dream. I they will, had the dream. I will say that, that the San Francisco metal scene hasn't been the same, in my opinion, since the pound. Oh, hell no. Since the pound closed, yeah, it's it's there's still venues here and there, but they're like mixed. I don't know. The pound was a special place, and everyone that's lived in the Bay Area for the last 20, 30 years that is in the metal, they all know about the pound, and it was all a bummer to dude. It was the secret spot, it was the secret spot, but because of that, that's of course was its undoing because the guys that were in charge were making boatloads of money, you know, they were. Because every metal person in the fucking vicinity of the Bay Area was there paying for the shows. So mm-hmm. long enough timeline, someone else is going to want a piece of that pie. And that's what happened. And they fucked them. They said, fucking, you, you did some bullshit against regulation, so we're going to charge you money. And they're like, fuck this. We know, we know this. We're out. That's some San Francisco shit. <laughs> San Francisco. All right. Well, those are – all right. And also, just to uh, <clears throat> get back to – the format here, anything that we're talking about, we would love to hear your guys' point of view, anyone listening, if anyone, you know, our, our three listeners. You know, I don't, we all got to start somewhere. Hey, it's all- <laughs> if you guys got any, what's your first concert? What's your first metal concert? Give us a funny, memorable uh, concert experience. You know, I feel like I'm giving people homework with all this typing, but I like reading this shit, so I don't know. Yeah, let us, uh, listeners, let us know, you know. I- I'd also be interested in hearing listeners first concerts as well because they're always good so that'll move us to the next bullet point which is just funny memorable concert experiences if you can think of any i can think of a couple i'm going to talk about demi borgir yes i'm calling it demi borgir i know it's demu borgier whoever the i don't care i'm saying it wrong you're saying it how you've always said it (laughs) i'm saying how i've always said it sometimes correct does not trump what feels good. It's kind of it like feels that. good to say to me, or gear. All right. Do you remember when Micah would always say Chuck Skoldner when it's actually Schuldner? <laughs> Schuldner. Yeah. And yeah. And that's kind of one of those things. I'm also like, you know what? That's he's, that's, he's comfortable saying it like that. I am never one to correct people on that. I'm like, you know, especially with something like Demi Borgir, it's like, it's been called that for so long wrongly. I'm not going back. I'm just not. I, I don't feel the need. I don't need to accentuate the accent. I don't say Francesca when I'm saying, you know. <laughs> I get I don't you, need, man. I, get I don't need to roll of the tongue. I support it. Thank I you. Guess, I get right. you on that. So this concert in particular, and uh, it was, where the fuck was it, dude? It was at a Great American Music Hall, Great American I believe. Music Hall, that's where, yep. I was there. There. Too. I know exactly what you're going to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> dude all right so first of all amazing show we were really heavy into to me that's when i think they came out with that apocalypse what is that album with the uh they had 
uh, Nick. Oh, Nick Barker on drums, and and yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, symphonic album, great fucking album, man. Um, and Children of Bodom were opening for Demi, and for us, we were like, this was their first American tour, Children of Bodom, and we were all heavily into them, following them, and Warman. Everybody shared this shit with friends, and we found this shit. So, great fucking experience, and I remember. This is a story that I tell people and I, sh- it sounds made up, dude. It really sounds like it didn't happen, but this is the kind of shit that in that era, you could get lucky in San Francisco and, and meet bro. I was outside of great American music hall by myself, having a cigarette and all the tour buses are parked, lined up. There's no one else around me. Tour bus door opens and here comes Alexi by himself. And I'm like, okay, I'm, there's no one else here. I'm going to go talk to this fucking guy. And he's short, first of all. I was like, dude, he's so short. What the fuck is that? <laughs> and I go up to him, I'm like, hey, man, fucking blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much for coming to America. Da, da, da. And he's like, oh, yeah, right. It's really cool. He's like, hey, you know where I can buy smokes? And I'm like, oh, I think this store over here is on the corner is open. So, all right, well, let's go. I'm like, yeah, all right, let's go. <laughs> fucking walking down San Francisco with Alexi. Yes. And we walked and shopped for a second in a store. That is- and I'm doing it trying to keep my you, – you walked right up after this because – I remember we, we came back from the store we, we stand next to the bus and we're sitting there chatting and you suddenly showed up and uh, what did you, I remember you asking him something. I think you asked, how do you oh, do that? Something simple like that. Yeah, I remember that. I said, how, how, cause I was so young and naive. I was like, man, how do you, how do you play so fast on the guitar like that? And he just looks at me and he goes, he sort of shrugs and goes, it, it's my job. <laughs> and I was like, that's my job, bro. That's a good enough answer. It's his job. So I'm like, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, dude, that was the shit. And uh, after that, I kind of left him alone. But I, I was starstruck. That was I was always starstruck meeting our metal heroes. But uh, so that was definitely a highlight. During the actual concert itself, though, the 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 real highlight of the evening was our singer at the time in our band Soul Asunder, Micah. Micah Maniac, as we called him, or his stage metal name. (laughs) So, at the time, he was a bit of a drinker. He had one or two in him, alcoholic beverages. He he might have had three or four. (laughs) So, I wasn't there. But I heard what exactly how it went down. So Great American Music Hall has a balcony where they allow drunk metal people to behave drunkly and metally. <laughs> so I guess Mike is up there and decides I'm going to jump off of this fucking balcony into the crowd. No stage dive, balcony dive. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, his face drunk, jumps off the balcony, lands in the crowd. And so I, I don't know. I don't know if I saw that one. I saw the second one. So, he, so, the bouncers don't kick him out. I don't know. Maybe he, I think what happens is he, he immediately got, got swallowed and absorbed into the people and escaped and they couldn't identify him. So he ends up back in the balcony for the rest of Demi's set. Then they played, God, what's the fucking, what is it? What the hell's the song? Oh, uh, the Demo Borgir song? Like, digga, 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 ding, 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 No, no. The Morning Palace. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So- <laughs> we were all waiting for it. We were all waiting for it. They start it. It was like their encore. The fucking place erupts. And I guess whoever was with Micah, Micah's like, yeah. And they said, Micah, you should jump again. He goes, okay. But this is so fucked up. He fucking doesn't realize there's this like brass railing on the balcony and his foot catches it. So instead of a leap, he just fucking gets caught and flops forward. Yeah. Head down. And that time I saw it and I heard it in the crowd. I heard a, a, a girl go, ah! I saw that. I saw the same thing. I was, I was only, I was standing on the balcony and I was only, uh, maybe ten feet away from him. And I saw him fall <laughs> like back first into the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> back first. <laughs> and I was like, I was looking, I looked down. I was like, oh, oh shit. I just remember hearing the girls, ah! and then the definitely caught him that time. And you just uh, see him. Yeah, go ahead. That's it. You, you see him above the crowd, like by the neck, just being fucking almost thrown out. 
Dude, I had never seen somebody get thrown out of a of a venue so fast. They were dragging him like at full speed out of the door, dude. I still never seen that. They threw him out there so fast, dude. <laughs> and we all stuck up for him, but we knew we were like, oh, we gotta get him out of here. This is but it was so legendary. Uh, thing is about that incident, Micah actually broke his ribs in that fall. Later to find out, he said, dude, I think I broke him on that first one. And, I, and I'm like, then you jumped again? He's like, yeah. <laughs> dude, he was a wild one, man. And, wild. dude, what a soldier, though, because we had our second show ever. And he actually did it. He did a show screaming metal vocals with broken ribs. Just the pain came out. He was just like holding his ribs on stage going, Aah! That's right. I remember that. Yeah. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> Do you remember that one show at the, uh, at the, in Monterey? What was it? What was that place they always played at? I forget. Lava Lounge. Lava Lounge. Yeah. The, the fucking, yeah, he. I remember he like had a fever of like a hundred and four while we were playing. <laughs> that he was like, "All right, guys, I'm going to the hospital." <laughs> oh my god! Dude, that's, that's so metal. That's oh man, he didn't get so awesome. Yeah, that was certainly a doozy. That was a great night, and we got to smoke with uh, Nick Barker. That's really good. Yeah, Micah. By the way, Micah just had a kid. Did you know that? Oh, yeah, dude, of course. You named him uh, Conan, I think, right? Conan, yeah. Conan. So fucking epic, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's so great, man. I'm happy for him. Yeah. All right. So, funny comments you got uh, that you can remember? Um, I know that there was one. Just let me think here. A, a funny... Oh, there was... <laughs> I remember the one time I... Uh... I I went to see it was at the pound again. I it was at the pound. I remember I went to see I wanted to go see some band. I think it was Soil Work. And I went in, I went to the show, but it was sold out. And I maybe I got there too late or something. And I was actually by myself. Um because I was living in the city at the time. I drove out there. I uh couldn't get in because it was sold out but i could hear the band playing i was like fuck so i i went around the corner and this that building had like a two side doors that they would open up at the very end of the show to let everyone out well there was there was like there was a the door was like cracked open and there was just a couple people standing outside and so i decided to walk over to that door and listen to the band i could sort of see them through the crack in the door i was like oh cool at least i could at least I sort of get to see the band. A lot like, of us have done that at least once. Yeah, and and then the door like slightly opened more, and then I and I thought about it for a second. I was like, okay, I think, if the, you know, I don't know maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe <laughs> no people notice. So I started, I started like, I started like, you know, shimmying kind of halfway through the crack in the two doors. Okay. So Again, something you can only do at the pound is get away with shit like this. Go well, ahead. Sort of, because what, okay. what, what ended up happening was I, I, uh, I feel like I got about halfway in, and then the band was playing. I was like, you know, cool. I, I, I was thinking to myself at the time, oh, cool. I, I sort of got in for free, um, and uh, I should be a little bit further in. I'm almost all the way inside now. And I think I was wearing a backpack at the time. And I remember just being thrown in the air. Like, I was, <laughs> lift, I was lifted up at full speed. And, and it felt like, it almost felt like my backpack was attached to, like, a helicopter. And all of a sudden, it just took off. I just went up in the air. <laughs> and I remember being thrown back. And I landed on my feet. And then there was a bouncer that he was the one that grabbed me, and he was like, what the fuck you doing, man? You, you, you didn't pray for the, the... He gave me a little spiel, and I was on my feet. I was just like, whoa, that was a, that was a, that was a ride. Like, <laughs> you know that feeling you get when you, like, swing on a swing, and you go really, really high, you go a little bit too high? Too high? You know, <laughs> I don't know, but... I, I felt like it was, I felt like it was, like, a little bit of g-force to this guy's tug 
He threw me so that did not sound good, bro. <laughs> it's a little what? bit of G force. I said that did not sound good. There's a little bit of G force to this guy's tug. What are you, Michael J. Fox, giving me a hand job? <laughs> well, I mean, what I'm just saying his his the way he grabbed me and threw me across. I was like, the way he <laughs> gently caressed. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, that was <laughs> funny. I was when I landed on my feet, I was like startled, and I was just like, oh shit, and. The guy was like, get out of here. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was one little concert, ex- sort of a concert experience. I remember, um, God, what else? I'll never forget the last time I had a guy's G-Force tug. And that's when Michael J. Fox jerked me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's good. 1.21 gigawatts. Yeah, well, wouldn't it have been Christopher Lloyd? Never mind. All right, so we move on. <laughs> I have another uh, quick concert, funny concert experience. This one involving you, Keith. Oh, my God, I don't even remember. Okay, well, Periphery came to town. Band oh. that we were... <laughs> This was a great, great night because, uh, you know, they finally came to our area. They, they played in Oakland uh, with – who the fuck else played? Somebody cool. Oh, we got to see Tesseract. No, oh, Textures. My bad. No, it was Textures. You're right. Finally got to see Textures live. Very, very cool. And Periphery headlining. Very awesome. Now, we kind of know – I don't like to say no. The guy's not like a friend. But we do know Misha of Periphery. He actually did a guest solo on – our band's last album because uh, before he really got big and started the gent scene, I would, a lot of people would catch him online. And he would aim on instant messengers with people because, you know, he was just a fucking an internet guy and he still is. So cool guy, always supported our music, even soloed on our stuff. He was my hero. Let me just stop and start here. Gent as it is, it is hated. Okay. By a lot of the metal community which I can kind of understand a little bit why. I mean, once core, quote, end quote, gets involved, they kind of ruin everything. And I think that's a little bit what happened. The core kids, you know, made Gent seem like fucking another candy core genre, like like hardcore and grindcore and shit. Yeah. I'm not trying to trash anybody who's a fan of these. There's, there's talented bands in all of these genres, by the way. I, can, I understand that. I can identify that better musicians than me and a lot of these bands of these genres, but sometimes it's okay to say it ain't for me, no matter what fucking society might be telling you in 2019. (laughs) Sorry. Not going to go on a rant. It's okay to say it just ain't for me. Anyway, love gent gent changed my whole life. It was one of those musical things that changed me again. Metal was one of them. Death metal again, uh, melodic death metal. Huge inspiration. That's exactly what band I, uh, style I chose to try to emulate. <clears throat> and that's what, how Soul Ascender started. Melodic death metal is my world. Death started that. Chuck Schuldner. And anything, you know, once Gent, <clears throat> once I started hearing Misha's music and discovered what he was going for, the groove, the Meshuga groove met with whole psychedelic, clean guitar stuff. That's how I always heard it. And this, in this fucking groovy ass shit, it, I remember the feeling. It was almost, it was kind of almost sad. It was like saying goodbye to an old friend, or a pet, or an animal that you had, or something. Where, where I stopped caring about the stuff that reminded me of melodic death metal, and I was only interested in the stuff that reminded me of bulb or gent or textures. That I could, I couldn't go back. You know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah. That yeah. milestone. Your, t- your preferences changed. That happens to me as well. It's kind of weird when it does. But I, I know it's yeah. it was sad how how um, how much I felt it, though. I really genuinely knew I would never write a song again that was influenced by that stuff, by those melodic death metal days, because of how much of an impression that new style. So I am victim to the gent genre there i said it well it was, you know, a lot of people who are into death metal despise it 
I'd like to talk about that for a minute though, because at the time it was it was kind of it was really cutting edge. You know, they were taking Periphery is a good example of a band that took like they took influence from bands like Mashuga with the syncopated rhythms, and they started uh-huh. adding a lot of really interesting harmony and. And it was like progressive, and it was just like this new sound at the time. I mean, I I I I thought it was awesome as well. I remember before Periphery became like a an established group, Misha, under his alias Bulb, released all these demo songs, and they were all sick as fuck and like really just yeah, cutting out. That and that's you know that's what I was referring to. I'm sorry to cut you off, but you, exactly that those demos is exactly what i'm referring to that yeah. was the change to me they were just too good at the time they're still good but a lot of those ended up being periphery songs later on which is interesting right and like all other genres they start getting oversaturated and that's where you get lost in it. i'm sorry i'm cutting you off go ahead what was your point no 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 but that's actually a good point as well because uh with, like pretty much like everything you know something becomes popular and then it becomes sort of this thing that people want to do and saturation almost seems inevitable. It happens in, with every style of music. I mean, look at like the different styles of rap that have come out and everything else, you know, even production styles in pop music, you know, get saturated. Everyone wants, everyone tries to emulate it, everyone else. It's just the nature of things, you know, but the cool thing is to find, you know, little diamonds in, in, in a, you know, in the sand where you're like, oh, this band's unique, this band, that, right. that's, that's, and that's some, which is a good point because that's something that'll always happen no matter how oversaturated stuff gets, no matter how many people pick up the guitars, there's always going to be those guys. There's Since always, most, there's always going to be somebody who looks at the instruments that you, that the usual instruments that are used in a rock band they're going to look at those instruments differently. They're going to approach songwriting differently. And that's always fun to discover. Yeah. Yeah. You got to sift through some shit. Some, anyway, I was, okay, so that's actually a good topic, uh, Gent. I'd like to hear other people's opinion on Gent, which, again, like the Demi Borgir thing. Hey, man, it's not how you pronounce it. Fuck you, I'm saying it. Hey, man, Gent's not a genre. <laughs> Fuck you. Yes, it is. I'm, it's too late. It's too far gone. It's easier. What, uh, this is what I say to people that go, it's not really genre. I've actually had this discussion at bars with people. I'm like, all right, I'll tell you what. If you can give me a better way to describe it in less than one syllable, I'll start saying it. Because it's always going to be, <laughs> it's actually progressive math. Big, 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 you know, fuck you. I'm going back to Jet. <laughs> Wait, I'm not, hearing that, I'm not hearing that ice shake enough. Because I'm out of ice, but I ain't getting up. <laughs> uh, no, you just, so I'm drinking this. So you just got to drink the vodka neat. <laughs> Is that what it's called? Neat? It's just, just ugh. It's yep. fucking, it's Bernie. Dude, I was late. I was running late for work the other night. <clears throat> so I was, re- everything was closed because I work graveyard shift. So I was resorted to gas station $1 jalapeno burgers. Oh my God, don't do that. Waveable. And they're flavorless. So they just throw on a bunch of these little diced jalapenos, like little razor blades. Mm, I don't know about that. That's, that's brutal. The vodka, the vodka's cooling it off. Back to the funny, <laughs> back to the funny concert experience. Periphery, oh, as we were saying. That's right. So they came to town. So I messaged Misha. I'm like, "Hey man, you're coming close, uh, close to my my fucking house. Can you get me on the list?" He's like, "You got it." I was like, right, "I'll bring you some beer because I worked at uh, Anchor Steam Brewery at the time." So I brought a case of beer for him. Showed up, and. Here is the story. There's two parts to the story. One, don't, sometimes it's better, you know that you've heard this, it's better to not meet your heroes sometimes. Mm. The other thing, I, thing I've always known, Keith's a piece of shit. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of, uh, I, I know. I'm just kidding. No, let me tell, let me tell. No, you're not a piece of shit. <laughs> But that I just come on for comedic timing. That was funny. So here's the story. <laughs> no, honestly, what I meant to say is a sometimes it's better to not meet your heroes. B you can always count on Keith to be Keith. That's what I meant. <laughs> it's not really any better. No, it's true. All right. Look, I was a little harsh. I thought it was funny. 
this is here's the story. Hey man, <laughs> Misha, can I, can I get on the list? Yeah, you got it. All right. So I show up with the beer, got a bunch of friends with me. Uh, I knock on the uh, their bus. Immediately, I get this cold vibe of snobs because uh, somebody opens it. What's up? I'm like, hey, I'm looking for Misha. And he's like, yeah, man, uh, I think he's inside. And the people in the bus kind of give me a look like, what the fuck? You know, it was just this real. I'm like, this is not Pantera party backstage shit, which is not necessarily the mood I was in. I just knocked on their shit. Uh, and I also had something. I was like, oh, well, I brought this for you guys. So their mood changed and lightened up a little bit. This was just a second. They just answered a question. I gave them the case of beer. Like, well, I brought this for you guys. Oh, right on. Cool. All right. No big deal. Misha just happens to pop outside. I'm like, yo. And, he's, and uh, I had to like remind him because we only spoke online, really. He didn't really know what I looked like. I'm just, Dude, Chaz, Soul Sunder. So we did the bro hug. He gives me this the laminate so I can get in. I got all right. There's beer for you in the in the in the bus. He goes, all right, cool man, awesome. A little bit of time passes. I think I've met somebody, smoked a bowl, <clears throat> and then Keith comes up to me. Uh, or no, first. Oh, did you tell me? I th- or did did Misha tell me? Somebody. All right, f- let me just. I'll say the story like this. Misha walks up to me. He's like, dude, who is Keith? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what he said. And I'm literally like, what? <laughs> Wait, first of all, <clears throat> what do you mean who is Keith? Keith's Keith. Yeah, he's my drummer. He's like, well, dude, listen, man. He said something like, we're, they, they had, apparently they had scheduled giving lessons of their or teaching their songs or some shit via fans. It's just fanboy shit. You know, it's kind of a sweepstakes, you know, when a chance to meet the band, yada, yada, whatever. Good for them. So they were, they had some fucking fanboy teaching them something. That's what their mood was all about. That's why they gave me a kind of a weird mood when I knocked in the thing. But apparently what Keith did was did not knock, but okay. Again, I'm going to say we were fucking used to the pound type almost red carpet. Everyone come on in. We met so many of our heroes backstage. We partied with them. We smoked out with soil work, fucking uh, hypocrisy. Uh, I smoked out with fucking Gene Hoagland. All right. Just me and him one-on-one, the bass player for soil work was smoking backstage at the pound. He's like, Hey man, I'm good. I think Gene would like to smoke. I'm like, Oh my God. Fucking one of the best nights of my life. We met Meshuga. We smoked out Meshuga. Another whole time for another story. So awesome. we were used to this. We were used to the VIP. Hello? Yeah. So we're used to this VIP type treatment, I think. So this is what Keith did. He did not knock on Periphery's bus. He just opened the door, stuck his head in, looked left and right. Is Chaz here? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's what I did, which was dumb because... because Somebody had, I was looking for you at that show and somebody had told me that, oh yeah, he might be with the, with the periphery guys. And I was like, oh, okay, well. You should go knock on their tour bus or no, you should go walk in. <laughs> well, what I did was, was I walked up to the tour bus and I heard people talking and I was like, Chaz must be in there because somebody said he was with, with. The- oh, I hear human voices. It must be Chaz McConnell. Well, because I couldn't find you anywhere else. You were nowhere else to be found. And I was like, where did he go? He must be on the bus. And I, to be honest, I was smoking a bowl with people. To be honest, I don't know why I did that. I just, it was absent minded. I wasn't about to run in on them. I was just, I cracked the door open and just looked in and was like, hey, is Chaz here? And then I remember Misha looking at me because, yeah, he's sitting down with some kid teaching him guitar and he's like, no, nah, dude. And I was like, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was like, I remember saying, oh, I'm sorry. And then I closed the door and I was like, walk back to the venue all embarrassed. <laughs> You're embarrassed. You embarrassed. Okay. So this is how I find out. Misha walks up to me in, in the venue in front of everybody. And it's not a, it's just like the whole crowds are right next to the merch table. And he walked in like, who is Keith? Basically, he's going on and on. To, he, I get to the point where I'm just like, all right, you know what? 
I'm tired of getting lectured. I, I just, I almost want to just pour my bottle of water on his head like I did at fucking Sepultura. <laughs> <laughs> I just basically, all right, no problem, man. I'll let him know. Da 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 da. Okay. But everyone kind of caught the vibe that he was being a, a dick. And it really sucked because it did totally spoil my image of a hero of mine, somebody who really changed the way I felt. But, you know, why should he give a shit about me? I get that part. But still, this is just why sometimes you shouldn't meet your heroes. But I also decided, fuck this guy. I will, I will defend Keith. And I think I even told you that. When I told you guys, would I, I was like, dude, I just got fucking chewed out by Misha like some angry dad. But I said it in a funny way. But I also said, fuck that guy. Keith, I got your back, you know, anytime, every time. So that's what I boiled down to. He didn't matter. And he took, he blew it out of proportion. They were snobby. Also, I will say after the show, I was talking to their singer at the merch table. I was like, dude, great set. Da, da, da. And Misha came up and just gave me, uh, you know, he gave me five. He, I think that was his way of the show went well. He was happier and he was chilled. And he's like, yeah, I just can't count. I was like, Hey, good set. It was sort of just squash without having to say anything. So, anyway, no biggie, but that was pretty damn funny. You know, what's funny is uh, even though it was my fault, really, um, I sort of, I get where he was coming from, though, because I, I, I did a silly thing by just opening that door. To this day, I don't know why I would have done that, but. Um, um, because we were used to dudes just being dudes with us when we met him, and, but it was still. Yeah, but he. Bad move, though. <laughs> It was a bad movie. You know, that tour bus is their home while they're on the road, and they don't want people. That's to... proper etiquette. Yeah, no, it was. It was. I mean, the, what's, what's funny about that is that I actually had met Misha. Uh, I want to say like three times after that incident, in in like you know future tours that they did coming around San Francisco, and I don't think he remembers that incident at all because I remember the last time I. Oh, was that. Yeah, the last time I hung out with Misha, I was with Yvette Young, actually. We went to see Periphery at the um, the Fillmore, and then she got backstage. Me and David went backstage, and we ended up just basically hanging in, in the green room with Misha, and they were just having conversation. I was just chilling there, and I, and I don't think he remembers me at all, which is kind of, I guess, a good thing. Um, yeah, no, I mean it was such a fleeting, quick thing, and and uh, yeah, bl- pretty much blown off, which it should have been. But pretty funny, pretty funny in my memory, that's for sure. It was a funny little chain of events for sure. So you know, we could go on and on about funny concerts. I'm sure sh- other shit's going to spring to mind, and we'll you know probably bring it up in later episodes. Anybody out there who has a funny fucking concert experience or an embarrassing one or crazy, fucking give us a funny story because. Uh, we're we're out of them for now. We're gonna move on to the next bullet point, which was uh, the new Rollo album. Before we move on to the listener reviews and recommendations, which we are getting to, I wanted to ask you about your new band's album. Uh, tell me a little bit about it, if you can. Sure. It's, uh, well, so I've been in this I've been in this group called Roland, uh, which no, we're not named after the electronics company. It's actually named after a person named Roland who. You know, was you know, after electronic company. No, <laughs> <laughs> and you know who I'm talking about too, because this this guy Roland, who we named the band after, also used to play bass in me and Shaz's old band, long, long time ago. Yes, Soul Asunder, which we keep talking about, the metal band. I, uh, I I stayed in touch with him over the years. He wanted to start a new project. I said sure. We started jamming together. We got these other two guys in named Casey and Joe, friends of his. We became a three guitar and drums band. We played a bunch of shows. And then one day, Roland decided to leave the band. He's like, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to do something else. And we're kind of like, oh, shit. Okay, all of a sudden. So he leaves. And me and the other two guys, you know, we're like, let's keep this going. This is fun. We're like, okay. Uh, What should we call this group? And we kind of bounced back and forth a couple ideas. And then one day, we all came to the idea that we should just call the band Roland after the guy that started the band and left, we thought it was funny. And Roland actually himself, he thought it was funny too. So we're like, well, this is great. Anyway, back to the It is a good band name, especially the way it happens because band names are hard, way harder than song titles or even album titles. Band oh. title. That's the hardest. I hate it. 
I've done it enough with pretty much with the same group of guys, which we get sick of each other anyway. So we're just, uh, it's my, I hate it trying to name a band. So that's a great way to name it. It's hard because, you know, it's going to, it's more, more, more than likely going to stick for a long time. So you, you don't want to. Right. Yeah. So yeah, f- lyrics are fleeting. Uh, song titles are a little less fleeting because it's stuck. Uh, fucking album titles, just a little less fleeting, but they still still be more albums. Band title. You're, you're, that's it. Yeah. You're stuck with it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah. So, well, we just, we, we were in the studio we uh recently actually uh as of about three days ago i think we finished tracking bass for a second album so we put out an album called enter the ronald uh maybe four or five enter the ronald which is kind of roland with mixing the letters up pretty much yeah (laughs) and um we were by the way oh i have to cut you off your last album what was the last album called enter the ronald Oh, that's what I'm sorry. Well, I was zoned out for half of that. I'm a fucking idiot. I got a second. I mentioned the album cover and inlay is got to be the ring champion of all fucking album cover and inlays that I've ever seen in my life. You guys win all the awards. Describe it. You're talking about uh, us on the four of us on horses on the beach. Yes, with the beautiful fucking horizon. Ah, uh, yeah. So- Dude, when I first saw that, it was because it also looks good. It looks nice photo photography. Yeah. And the concept and oh I, I was just like, dude, that's it, pack it up. No one's ever gonna hop this idea. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm to this day I still there's been some good ideas, like guys just eating lunch, making a mess. <laughs> We've seen those. You know, our metal bands especially just having just eating burritos. Uh, what was one of Ontogeny's, I think Nate's idea was to just look like all badass with your arms crossed in front of a shitty ass beat up car. Oh, each of our own cars. <laughs> your own shitty cars yeah. at the time that were just this fucking horrible hoopties. And uh, the roller coaster idea, we're probably, this is bad. We're giving everybody ideas to steal. But the roller coaster uh, band photo for the CD inlay is the funniest, one of the funniest ones. Just everybody, yeah. <laughs> I hope somebody does that as the album comes. Dude, that is the best idea. But you guys on horseback in a beautiful fucking photograph. Yeah, this mwah. I'm doing the fucking mwah Italian thing. Like a, <laughs> it's funny because like I think Joe's wife took the photo on the beach. That was actually uh, in um, Half Half Moon Bay, and um, Joe. He's a graphic designer, so he sort of, he sort of like did some touch up on that photograph, and he added like this weird storm off in the distance, off the coast. That's kind of cool. And yeah. So anyway, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if we can ever top that that cover. To be honest, you're right. So, um, I'm for it too. I mean, obviously, everything, the whole story is told in the photo. You guys, I, I'm didn't. I've never asked about it. Never talked about it. You guys have had also had to have sprung for some cash for to make that happen. So I don't know what scheduled some writing lessons or writing tours or something like that at a ranch. We pretty much just met up. Joe organized the whole thing. We just met up um, in Half Moon Bay one day. The four of us. Uh, Joe, one of his friends, and then his wife was there, of course, to, to take the photograph. And yeah, Joe basically rented. Uh, little horseback riding on the beach for the day and he and he he, he fronted all the money to rent the four horses and everything he just paid for the whole deal and we're like this is awesome this is like a, a day with horses on the beach and the album cover it's freaking great production level yeah at the highest, uh, you know uh, production value at the highest level i am i commend you but okay yeah new album tell me a little bit about it so we can uh wrap this shit up with the lose uh with the next shit for sure the um so just to start off, the, you know, the first album was recorded at like a studio in the city and um, through a friend and Lars ended up mixing it. It came out pretty good. It's a very raw recording. But this time around, we ended up going with Zach Oren, who um, runs a studio in Oakland. And Zach Oren has recorded so many metal bands. He's done Fallujah, Animosity. He's done wow. Machine Head. Wow. And all these all these fucking bands and he's he's the most professional engineer I've ever worked with. 
He made my drum sound amazing. We just finished the guitars. We just finished the bass. Um, and we're mixing it. Um, and it sounds, it's, it's, let me put it this way. It's, it sounds like the first album, a little bit slower, a little bit more groovier. Um, there's more effects on the guitars, like in terms of pedals that Casey and Joe use. Um, it, it's super heavy and he, Zach made my drums sound so good. I, to, when this album comes out, I think it'll be the best sounding drums on any album that I've ever been on, to be honest. Wow. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. They're the best sounding, it's the best drum production I've ever been a part of on any album that I've ever, and you know, you and I, we've done Soul Sunder, IDSF, this and that, Ontogeny. I've been on all sorts of albums. And these drums just kill all those albums. No offense. <laughs> but, oh, uh, man. Hey, no, I understand. We didn't know shit, dude. We were, we were the epitome of the garage band. Just plug, show up, plug in and play. Not tech savvy. We didn't care about equipment, which some people are addicted to it. Which, honestly, I always admire those kind of guitar players. But something my dad told me a long time ago, and he's played with many guitarists, many more than me. He's a, he's a jazz uh, bass player. And he, he said something to me that I've never forgotten one time. He goes, I've never met a guitar player who's happy with his sound. <laughs> Meaning on stage. On stage, they're always fidgeting. With the, it, they're never, ever happy with their tone. And man, that's what those rack mounts and all that shit, I, I, I kind of, I get it. I kind of get it. And, but on the other hand, it's kind of like any art. It's never done. No, it's yeah. just you be that scientist of sound engineering. And I always kind of admired that. But we were definitely the plug in and play bottom of the barrel equipment. I mean, look at this. Look at uh, that. Dude, that's going to be a whole other episode. We're going to dedicate half an episode to our of our first gear. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a great one to do. All right, go ahead. It's funny. We, it, it's totally true what you're saying about guitar players, and also the fact that you know your, yours and my band Soul Cinder back in the day, we were a metal band that was acting. Like, we were like acting like a punk rock band in terms of like gear and stuff. We're just like whatever works. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah. we were a garage band, absolutely. But we were a garage band. I don't know. We were a garage band that did more than most garage bands. Certainly didn't make it, quote unquote. But go ahead, Roland. Well, new album. Yeah, it's going to be out. Well, hopefully it'll be out on streaming platforms. Uh, we basically need like one more day of mixing. And then we scheduled that for October. As soon as that's done, we're going to put it up online. Um, hopefully, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say in the next month or two. And yeah, if people want to check it out, I'm sure it's going to be on Roland. It's rolandbandsf.bandcamp.com. That's where you can hear the first album. I'm sure we're going to put the second one up on the same site. Rolandbandsf is one word. Dot bandcamp.com. And if you like instrumental, like heavy progressive rock, is probably the best way to describe it. It's it's kind of metal, but it's also kind of rock. It's angular and it's got weird, quirky moments. Um, angular, I like that description. Yeah, it's 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 not like mathy, but it's like there's you know there's different time signatures and it's kind of mathy, bro. Yeah, it's it's, it's leaning to gent. The stuff, the clips that I've heard in the studio, uh, you guys tracking? I I'm gonna say gent e genty. There's some chunky moments for sure. Lots of ch not chunky genty. Uh, yeah, Genty Groove moments. It definitely has groove. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much it, man. I'm, I'm really excited. I've been listening to it since our last session with Zach and super stoked. I can't wait till it's released. Awesome. Keith, you're the king of the plugs. I'm going to send all the plugs to Keith since he's so articulate. <laughs> all right, we're going to move on to the next bullet point. Looking forward to the new Roland album. Uh, so here we are. We're gonna, this is how we end each episode. This one kind of ran, ran kind of long, but it was actually fun to talk about this shit. Uh, Hell yeah. Again, all stories we'd like to hear from you guys are going to relay back, but here comes the end of the episode, which is um, what we're trying to make the hook. 
which is <clears throat> reviews and recommendations, meaning listeners have commented on our social media uh, reviews of last episode's recommendation. And the next episode will lead to the next epi- uh, recommendation and so on. So this is how I'm starting to slur. I'm glad we're wrapping up. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> ice is melting. There's that ice. I was waiting for it. So let me- <laughs> Let me just fucking cut to the chase. <laughs> uh, last episode, the recommendation was the new Tool album because me and Keith reviewed it. So we asked you guys to review uh, the new Tool album. And anyone who gave us a nice in-depth review got to sort of earned their spot to uh, give us a recommendation to review, which we did. So we got a couple that I'm going to read here from a couple guys and uh, then we'll get to the recommendation. So let's start with Brian Wyatt. Brian Wyatt commented on Facebook in response, dude. Thanks for the uh, response. Hey, guys. Totally dig the first episode, especially hearing your discussion about tools, fear, inoculum, since it's currently the thing I'm listening to the most. That and IDSF coming home go well in the same playlist. Hey, thanks for the shout out. Shout out, bro. Heck yeah, dude. Uh, that said, I'm afraid I don't quite share in Chaz's pessimism about the current status of music. This is a good year. I'm not pessimistic, you fucking <laughs> dick. <laughs> Asshole fuck shit. No. <laughs> just let, kidding. Hey. Let me just say. Don't just. What? Let me just say, what's up, Brian? It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just say, look, man, don't just call me pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> you know how the rest go. Oh, yeah. All right. Going back to Brian's comment. So, fear inoculum, dot, 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 shit. <laughs> what, can be sa- what can be said that hasn't already been <laughs> yeah. so I was like, What can be said that hasn't already been said or, uh, already? I can't fucking read. Of course, I love it. And like Keith said, only a couple of songs grabbed me at first. Invincible was in my head a lot. But then one friend said, dude, Tempest, or seven and pissed no. <laughs> that is how it's written it's kind of weird and my other friend said dude fucking numa and i'm like all right i'm gonna listen to those again and now i love the whole album see there's something about that second time through all right back to brian yes even chocolate chip trip which sometimes i let play around in my pocket while i'm at work <laughs> that's great actually all right <laughs> listening to descending Listening to Descending with Keith in mind, I heard what he was listening for, and it gave me a new uh, appreciation for the intricacies of what Tool does best. Usually, when I listen to a song, I want the lyrics in front of me as a guide to the structure. But that probably comes from growing up huffing jewel ca- new jewel cases. I get what he means by that. <laughs> <clears throat> by the way, Keith, that warehouse in Del Monte Shopping Center is where I bought my first Tool album ever, Opiate. Oh, that's awesome. So anyway, Descending is a treme- is tremendous in its scope in that it's both explosive and intense, but also an easy listen. As John Hammond once said, <laughs> John Hammond from uh, Jurassic Park, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a ride. <laughs> in quotations. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, uh, that's, that's so good. I also, feel, I also feel like all the time they took to produce this album allowed them to pick all the best sounds from their cachet. Overall, Fear Inoculum is amazing, and it's steadily climbing to the top of my favorite tools. That's a great review. Great <laughs> review, dude. Thank you. That's, that's what we're talking about. And I, I feel like I'm, we're giving people homework, typing all this shit, but it kind of makes you put these thoughts that are bouncing around your head in the context. So I like reading it better review than I gave. I'm still laughing about the John Hammond. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. So moving on to thanks, Brian, moving on to uh, Brian's recommendation, uh, which is, let's see, by the way, I was finding this before I mentioned Brian's recommendation. I was trying to find this on uh, YouTube and I discovered other previous. First of all, let's just say the band he's recommending is Catatonia. Uh, 
and it's just i'm like dude why do why are there so many re-released stuff like i remember the last time i tried to uh find sounds of perseverance on the internet all i could find is the digitally remastered why do bands digitally remaster shit is it necessary really i don't think so i thank you i'm just like dude it, it most of the time is pointless just give me what i remember i i, I yeah. feel like it it never really works out uh, george lucas re-released the original star wars and all he did was digitally replace princess leia's twat with a lizard or whatever it's kind of a ride. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, All right. Anyway, so Brian's recommendation. <clears throat> and we're going to go back to Brian's comment right here. The next album I would like you guys to listen to and review is my favorite Catatonia album, The Fall of Hearts. It is definitely one for fans of heavy progressive rock, while at the same time nostalgic for fans of bands like The Cure. All right, so before me and Keith, just as we agree, you guys give us a nice review of uh, of the last episode's recommendation, which was Tool. Then you guys can recommend us an album. Me and Keith will listen to it that week, and we give our review. So me and Keith listen to it. Before we get into that, we're going to give you guys a quick little 30-second snippet of uh, – so here it is. Catatonia, Fall of Hearts, recommended by Brian Y. Sense my grave, way below the mire. Sorrow will find you. Its voice is given way. All right, so that's Catatonia. Um, I would actually like to go first. Go for it. So first, let me just get this out of the way. Catatonia just so happens to be my favorite band. And that is a bold statement, but yes, it's true, Brian. People have asked, it, it, I have two easy answers if I ever get the question, who is your favorite band or who is your favorite metal band? Two different questions i think and the easy answer for me catatonia as an ensemble mm. as far as favorite metal band easy answer mashuga but that's another thing catatonia i feel like it just the mood they create is their own i can't think of a group of guys that do something that is so goddamn perfect that any other band since tool there was a time my friends used to say to me because I was so obsessed with Tool. They, I remember, I don't remember who it was, but I remember them saying, you know, there's other bands, Chaz, besides Tool. Because they were just, they were getting sick of it. But I was obsessed. And I feel Catatonia really took a lot of things to the next level. They don't sound anything like Tool. However, I don't know. They, they created their own thing. Their whole catalog is interesting because they've done many albums. The first half of their career was more metal. Uh, they're Swedish. Uh, they're affiliated with Opeth. They've actually, they're in a band called uh, Bloodbath, where members of Catatonia are with Mikhail from Opeth. And uh, they, they're best friends. In fact, I read an article once that said, uh, I think it was Opeth talking about it. And he said, there is a tradition that he has with his friends in Catatonia that every time either one of them come out with a new album, they have a listening party. They, the whole bands gather together in a fucking studio and they listen to each other's new album. And of course, they're not always at the same time. So one year or one month, Opeth goes over just to check out Catatonia's new album. One year they go to check out, you know what I mean? You get it. So it is an interesting part of the interview is Mikhail said, speaking while the album is playing is forbidden. Oh, so that's the kind of listening parties I like. You know what I mean? When it comes to album playthroughs, and I like to do this with you guys any chance we get. Like, I, it's a ritual. So you can really listen. You save your, your comments for later. 
And I, I just thought that was a great write-up. So anyway, Catatonia, Fall of Hearts, they're my favorite band. Uh, the singer, Jonas, is in my top three favorite singers of all time. Mm. He's not even... He doesn't do anything very firework-y, but his choices and his notes and his phrasing, uh, and plus his stage presence with this heavy music going on. I like. Th- there's a video of him, and he just stands perfectly still with his hair down. And I don't know. I feel more intimidated by that than what I see every lead singer do. Which is to say, you know, you don't want every band to do that because then it would just be stupid. Stage presence, presence, and you know, is important and it gives you their individuality as a singer. But him just standing dead still and just singing it, I'm like, this guy fucking rules. And everything about him, his lyric choice, his his melody choices. But let's get to Fall of Hearts. This is their newest album, and uh, I had heard it before. Of course, very familiar with it. But since Brian recommended it. I listened again, and I definitely got a whole new appreciation for the album. Um, what I will say about it, as far as my perspective, it's hard to really... You could almost shuffle the last three albums they put out. Night is the New Day, uh, Dead End Kings, and Fall of Hearts. You could shuffle the track list, and you might get lost in wondering which where, where does what go. They're so similar. But that's not necessarily a negative... Uh, uh, review. I like the direction that they went because the album before that, The Great Cold Distance, had much more of a, I don't know, a hard hitting rock approach. Catchiest album, one of the catchiest albums I've ever heard vocally and riffs. But they started to go into this storybook mode. And I think they've stayed there for the last three albums. So it's going to be hard for me to differentiate how I feel on this material versus the two albums prior. I'm going to do it in metaphors, which is something I just like to do because I'm obnoxious. <laughs> but this is the best I can do is almost like a land on a visual metaphor for what I feel like I can, I can say this much of the last three albums, the album night is the new day. Sounds like it's lit by street lights, like dim yellow street lights in a rainy road leading to a cityscape. That's what that album feels like. The album after that, Dead End Kings, feels like it's it was lit by torchlights in a cave. Mm. Uh, Fall of Hearts feels like the album is lit by candlelight while I'm writing some leather-bound book with some feathery pen. And that's as hippie as I've ever sounded. <laughs> but that's all I got. That's my review for Fall of Hearts, which I really strongly recommend if anyone's not heard that album or the band in general. That's even a great album to start with. It's just fucking beautiful. And the mood they create is their own. Love the album. Great recommendation. Sure. Go for it. So for me, it's um, uh, listening to it. It's very, I, I get what you say about, I get what you're saying about how it's production wise. It's very similar from the last, the two albums that came before it. Um, uh, Night is the New Day and Dead End Kings. But I feel like it's a little bit more progressive than those two albums. Like Night is the New Day and the Dead End Kings had a, had a very um, what's the word? To th- what's the word? Maybe like a like a very uniform sort of writing style. But um, the Fall of Hearts was interesting, it's particularly in that first song. I think it's called Takeover. I remember when I first heard that, it, there's no intro, there's no build-up. It's just, the music just starts on the downbeat, bam. He starts singing. There are these beautiful chords going by, and it's a long song, too. The first track on the album is like seven minutes, and which I thought was an interesting start to an album. And Because uh, usually their songs are maybe four or five minutes tops. Um, but it really stuck out of my mind, and, and I thought it was really interesting the how that song moved around from beginning to end it started off with this pretty thing and then it went into this weird sort of like when it gets heavy it almost kind of reminds me of like i don't know like black sabbath or something like that with the guitar riff um but yeah my review is it's uh, it's a beautiful sounding album uh honestly i actually like um I think I like Night is the New Day a little bit more, but I think it's definitely up there as, you know, 
in terms of the, their entire discography. It, you know, the writing is great. Um, I prefer when they write more like concise songs. And what I mean by that is on Night is the New Day, every song was was a tight three or four minutes. It had a, every song had a very similar structure, but all the ideas in each of those songs was just so cool. And I liked that format that they used that, that the, the way that they decided to tell the story through these, you know, really short, almost pop song format songs the fall of hearts is more progressive. Like I said, it's there's, there's more, there's each song has more parts, you know, there's more movements here and there, which I like. Um, and I think my, I, that, that the one song that really stands out the most is that first song. Uh, what's it called again? I already forgot what it was called. Um, takeover. Yeah. So yeah, I would recommend it to anybody who's getting into Catatonia for sure. I would say it's their their most progressive album for sure. I think that's my review. All right, and uh, let me just say real quickly, what's your favorite Catatonia album? Well, I, I you know I kept on mentioning that it, my favorite one is actually because I listened to it again recently, and uh, Great Cold Distance is definitely mm-hmm. my yeah. Yeah. See that my answer is uh, it's it has to be Night Is the New Day because of the new direction that they went, that they're still in. And since they went that direction, not a flaw, not a flaw, both albums, dead and Kings and fall of hearts. It's like, dude, you guys just keep fucking and keep it up. Oh my God. There's nothing like it. Night in the, as the new day was that change. It was that uh precipice. What do you call it? It's not even that. It's not the right word for it. It's, it was just their, it was their milestone. That's the better word. And, uh, but I just, my answer is, Favorite because of the songs themselves. Night is the new day is my favorite Catatonia album, but I'm almost heartbroken that my answer isn't a great cold distance because <laughs> oh. it deserves it. So I get you. That is the catchiest fucking album ever. It's so good. It's 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 also, but I see what you mean because great cold distance is a little bit more. It's a little grittier and heavier. Whereas, they serious, I feel like. I feel like they got ser- – these guys are serious. Not to, Which isn't to say they haven't been serious before that. And Viva Emptiness is certainly worth mentioning. Which brings us to our next listener uh, review and recommendation. First, let's get to his review of Tool Inoculum from Episode 1. And uh, this comes from Psychoral, who commented on our YouTube channel – Right on, bro. Thanks for getting involved. So here we go. Here's Psychoral's Tool rec- uh, review. Favorite Tool album has to be Enema, but honestly, Fear Inoculum is quickly becoming close to the favorite. Brian, Brian Wise said the same thing. Yeah. So here we go. Fear Inoculum review. Listening to it the first time, I liked it, but I didn't truly get it yet. A lot of what Keith was saying, minus see, everyone's got... <laughs> Everyone's agreeing with Keith. I see how it is. No. That's right. This was expected. Keith's the smarter one of the bunch. All right. So here we go. A lot of what Keith was saying, minus any of the I was disappointed in quotes parts. Eh, well, never mind, maybe. Also, <laughs> to your point late in the session, hearing the music on a great sound system almost makes it a completely different <laughs> song. I first heard it on my computer speakers, which are decent but I didn't crank it. I liked it, of course. No complaints. But when the missus was out of town for the weekend, I put on my 9.1 whole house speakers and cranked it. It was more than a song. It was a feeling. Well, that was pretty gay, Psychoral. No. <laughs> no, I feel you. It was a feeling. I was surrounded in the sound, and it made it a whole different album. Exactly, dude. You can't get this out of earbuds. Young people don't even know. All right, moving on. Back to his comment. Highly recommend it. He means in a big system. It's an incredible album and worth the wait. Fear Inoculum, in quotes, to me, could either be an antidote of fear, like you mentioned, or it could be touching kind of the vicarious tip. 
the song by Curious because it's in quotes, where it's almost like we need fear in order to make things feel right. Favorite song from Fear Inoculum, Numa. I agree. It's a good uh, one. He's he's responding to uh, our other things we talked about. He says, uh, "Where was I when Ten Thousand Days came out? I was working with Brian Kenny, which is our old guitar player in Soul Asunder and a friend of all of our old old buddy. I was working with Brian Kenny at a development company, living in San Francisco with John and Eugene. In parentheses, sorry everyone, but Keith and Chaz know these people. Yeah, I'd listen to it daily at home." In the car and at work with headphones. Brian Kenny and I would IM back and forth about how sick the album was. Cool. Yeah, that 10,000 days. It's fun to... This is... We don't have a lot of bands to do this. I don't know how many bands waited 13 years between albums. Can we name one? Is there one? name one. It's kind of... This is sort of an... This is, uh, you know... It's a thing. It's a thing. All right, let me just say awesome, Psychoral, or as I like to call, Jim. What's up, Jim? <laughs> Here's his recommendation for us, which is Persephone. Is that how I pronounce it? Uh, Persephone, yeah. So here's back to Jim's comment. Recommendation for next review Persephone, Asthma. All right, I guess it's an acronym, is the name of the album, A A T H M A. Mm hmm. I didn't do my homework. I didn't research what this album was about. So maybe, uh, you know, Psychoro, Jim, if you want to fucking give us a reply on this, what, tell us more about it. Anyway, before we get into our reviews, let's get uh, back into his comment. Firstly, I actually found these guys by accident. Mike, again, sorry, but Chaz and Keith knows him. Yeah, we know Mike. Uh, he sent me Spotify a Spotify link to The Odious. Haven't heard them yet. And since I have the free version, I clicked play. But unbeknownst to me, I started playing Persephone instead. LOL. I was like, oh, shit, Mike, Persephone. And he was like, what? Who? So anyway, super happy accident. They're a progressive melodic metal band from Andorra, an independent principally situated between France and Spain. Instant win. Favorite song so far, Prison Skin. And then he puts, careful, their video comes with an, ep an epilepsy warning, so you know it's good. All right. All right, well, cool. Well, as agreed, we, me and Keith listened to this album this week, so we could give you a review. But before we get into that, like before, we're going to give you a little quick audio. So it's 30 seconds of Persephone, recommended by Psychoro. All right, Persephone. That's some Persephone for you. Uh, Keith, why don't you go first? Uh, so I, I get the album a listen. And these guys are really talented guys. The, the guitar players have amazing riffs. Um, the songs are very progressive, lots of movements. Um. And uh, so there are some beautiful moments. Um, I, to be honest, wasn't really a fan of the, of the clean vocals, the singer. I felt like they were a little theatrical for my taste. Uh, All right, I'm going to need to. I know, but I did ahead. like the scenes, though. Those, were, those sounded really cool. Um, no. To be honest with you, I, I feel like this is the type of album that I would have been really, really into many many years ago when I was more into this style of metal I appreciate the musicality of it but stylistically for some reason it just didn't really do a lot for me uh -huh. um, but that's not to say that it's a bad album by any means it's if people are into you know progressive melodic death metal this album is definitely up your alley 
And that's what I would say. All right. That's fair. I have to say I had a totally different reaction than Keith, which isn't to say I disagree with what you just said. I understand what you said. Mostly the thing I can hang on to is when you said, I feel like there was a uh, paraphrasing. There was a time that this shit would have been like your shit, right? This has been like, whoa. So, right. That's kind of what you were saying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because of that time, uh, like the pound days, basically, like we were just talking about, there was a time where let's face it at the gates. That's where it really started for real, you know, people who know metal must know this at the gates is where it came from slaughter of the soul yeah they were kind of the which is huge and you know sometimes it happens like that man sometimes a band comes out with one album and that album happened to be slaughter of the soul that resonated with america uh at the gates it has great albums even before that i can't remember the titles because it's been so long since i've delved into this old great classic stuff but there was albums before that album uh, uh, that uh, At The Gates released that are excellent. But for some reason, when they did Slaughter of the Soul, that struck a chord and America ran with it. And suddenly you get bands like Unearth, uh, All That Remains, Lamb of God, As They Lay Dying, uh, anything that resembles melodic Swedish death metal in America came from Slaughter of the Soul At The Gates, period. Period. Yeah. There's no fucking. And you know what? The funny thing is, that same thing happened again with another huge movement and another huge tremor in the metal world. That album was Necrophagist. That was the next step. Would you agree? Yeah, I remember when that album came out, the second album. And s- suddenly another thing happened in America where it was just an earthquake of a change. Suddenly, you stopped hearing anything that resembled Slaughter of the Soul at the gates. And it became sweeps, guitar arpeggios and sweeps, and it became the faceless, and it became cattle decapitation. All of this grindcore shit birthed out of one single album, Necrophagist. No, there were other bands. I mean, at the same time, you know, Children of, Children of Bodom, which is not really a technical band, but they're flashy. They were still pretty big at the time, and of course, Finnish music sort of bled into Swedish almost. I would say so, yeah, to an extent. All right, okay. Well, anyway, let me just wrap up my review of uh, Persephone. So, where I was leading with that whole rant was there was a time where melodic death metal reigned, and for me, the journey. As an American, because this stuff happened a long time ago, but it only reached us, you know, 10 years after, you know, 10 years later, it was shown to me by Brian Kenny, our old guitarist. He, he just, all these his huge fucking treasure chest of bands it was in flames. And then after a long era of in flames and at the gates and stuff of that nature, all Swedish guys, of course, o- Opeth's really not melodic death metal. They are from Sweden, but they're all their own, like Meshuga. They just created, those are two total other elements. You know, they're their, uh, they're their own fucking element on the elemental chart. So, but I will say, after In Flames at the Gates type era, suddenly soil work came out which you could tell was like a mishmash of almost like a mishmash of other Swedish bands like uh, in flames and at the gates, but faster and on crack, not quite technical, not tech death at all by any means. However, the production was razor sharp. They were faster, more intense, just high octane in flames. And they changed everything. They soil work was a big, big, big influence on um, soul asunder in our original band. Yeah, X Toll is a whole other conversation for a whole other uh, episode. Oh, for sure, yeah. So we'll save that. But Persephone, this is what I'll say first. I was excited when I heard this. I was like, man, I wasn't expecting much when I heard progressive melodic death metal. But that's why in Jim uh, Sycoral's comment, he put progressive melodic death metal. That one word that's a big bridge you know what i mean that really puts that fills a lot of blanks 
or rather it doesn't. And honestly, it creates a whole diff different, uh, a whole, a different wedge is thrown into the genre of something unexpected, right? That's what I feel when anything, when prog or progressive is thrown in the mix of what else you're seeing in the genre, you know, genres suck, but you still kind of need them to know what you're about to listen to, sure. to know if you even want to bother. Mm -hmm. When you put progressive melodic death metal, I'm like, all right, well, where is this progressive? Where? And now after hearing the album, very, very impressed. I feel like they are the most impressive thing I've heard in melodic de death metal since soil work. And that was a long time ago. I'm sure there's been many bands that have come and gone, you know, Dark Tranquility, great production. However, they never really had the intensity and the high octane thing that soil work had. Sure. They're very clean, very good songwriting, very deep, runs deep. These guys are phenomenal. They brought, it ain't quite genty. It ain't quite mashuga e, but it's, it's the, it's the rhythmic fucking twist executed the, better than I've ever heard in any other melodic death metal band, even from Sweden. And these guys aren't, I feel like they took that Swedish sound. They put some, I can kind of get the French thing. Cause the only, the only other band I could think of was symbiosis. Remember that band? Very obscure. Yeah, I remember them. French band. They were lightning. I will say, I would like to add one thing. I, 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 I did find the, the little piano, uh, passages to be really, really interesting and cool on, on the Persephone album. I'm glad you added that because that was my next little uh, note here. Piano. Let me talk about the piano for a minute in this band, Persephone. I've, best, this is a big fucking statement. It's a bold statement. Best piano work I, I think I might have ever heard in metal. And that's a huge, I've heard some great, like Insomnium, Great band, but you really heard basic just sort of runs. Na, 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 na. It's the only thing that really stands in my mind. Warman, Children of Bodom is a different beast. That is that is uh, fireworks, like, you know, uh, uh, listening to classical runs articulated beautifully. Dragon Force, same thing. Very impressed. Dream Theater, we get all that. We've heard that, and we're impressed. I'm not taking anything away from that. Tastefulness. This this is what this is all. When I first heard Persephone's piano work and their uh, songs, I'm like, dude, guest guest starring John Williams on piano. <laughs> yeah, the guy really really good. Did the piano work? He, he had some really interesting ideas. And your muscle, sorry. Oh, he, the, 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 there you... the piano player had some really good ideas and. And different sort of stuff too, stuff that I hadn't really normally heard in metal, which I really enjoyed. Very tasteful, very executed. Fucking, I was. It, it's film score. It made me feel like a movie soundtrack, which I'm a huge mm -hmm. film score guy. And and the, these guys did did it right. I mean, Winter Sun has had some great fucking stuff. I know Jim's into that, but these guys just brought it home. I think. And also, I'm going to say to the first of all, every buddy in this band came meaning business they all mean business they are fucking pro they are good at what they're fucking doing uh the vocalist gives me a randy from lamb of god vibe mm. very fucking good uh fierce kind of mica sometimes i can see that yeah um the riffs have personality that's another thing there's one thing about hearing a melodic death metal band with Two guitarists on the left and right, following in harmonies, going. Yeah, okay, cool. I'm playing Mega Man on the NES. Anybody can kind of do that, and even if you do it well, it's still what it is. These riffs have personality. Uh, these riffs are kind of. It, it caught me off guard. These guys, uh, there's riffs that occasionally that I'm like, dude, this guitar is talking to me. This isn't just a fucking riff. And I always admire that when bands can do that. So I got to say, great recommend. The drummer goes off. The guitar players have some... It's everything you need when it comes to metal. It's intense, good shit. I'm glad to know in this style, shit like this is still going on. Yeah. It, you know what I'd like to add before we move on? Yeah. yeah. I agree with you on everything you said. My only... I think the main thing that sort of was hard for me to get past is 
So aside from the singer, I think the um, the structuring of the songs uh, to me was a little was a little weird. I didn't quite like the way it flowed from beginning of end to each song. But there were definitely moments where, well, there was a lot of moments where, yeah, the guitars were just just going off and and really really sick riffs for sure. They had a lot of sick riffs in a lot of those songs. So I will definitely agree to that. Awesome. All right, well, look, we got one more uh, review from last episode and recommendation. However, this episode ran a little long, so this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start next episode with our third review. Guys, we're just starting out. We, we want to make sure people are interested in listening. And also, you know, I have to piss really bad. <laughs> I'm going to stop making other excuses just to say we want to make this better as it goes along. Um, we do have one more review and it comes from Mauricio. Dude, thank you for fucking getting involved. We're going to read your review. We're going to start episode three with your review and that'll give us a good thing to start with. But, uh, uh, he also has a recommendation for us. But before, uh, speaking of Mauricio, I just want to throw out a shout out to an old friend Mauricio's band. He has a band with a new album coming out. Their band's called D roll. That's D apostrophe R O L L. And, uh, they've got, a song on YouTube. I would, I would have played a little clip on this episode, but one reason one, I didn't ask permission. Reason two, I'd rather send you guys to go check their video out on YouTube of their first song. They got a new album coming out. They come out. I think they're hailing from Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken. And this is uh, and Mauricio. He's. I don't know if you ever really met him. Did you meet Mauricio? But you definitely bought a drum set from him. So no, you must have met. I met him a couple times at Brian's house. Yeah. Well, this is an old dear friend of mine and we were, uh, you know, in the bands together. Uh, anyway, his band is called D roll. And the song I want to recommend is called, I can't pronounce this. Keith, can you pronounce it? Uh, for, uh, fuera de mi contexto. Which means out of my context, right? Yes. All right. So look, what you want on YouTube is D roll. And S U E R A D E M I contexto out of my context, and you will find it. We actually we're gonna have a link on our video. Um, Keith's better at the plugs, but dude, you really need to get a laptop so you can read some of this shit. Oh yeah, oh I can read it on my phone. All right, well we'll figure it out. Listen, thanks everybody for listening, and again. <laughs> What we're going to do is end every episode with our reviews and our recommendations. Now, since every, all the guys from episode one that gave us a review, they pretty much earned their spot for a recommendation. So what we're recommending on episode two here is Catatonia and Persephone. You guys should check them out. They made us check them out. We checked them out. We gave you a review. Enjoyed both of them. Good stuff. Um, anyone who wants to recommend one of those bands and give us a review of them, then there you go. There you have it. You are sharing music with each other and life's beautiful. No. <laughs> so that's the ticket, but I also don't want to give anybody too much homework. So anyone that wants to check this shit out and is still listening and wants to recommend anything, just drop us a comment on YouTube or drop us a comment on Facebook. We will have the links available drop us a recommendation. What do you want us to review? And in the meantime, you're listening. You want to check out some of these bands? Give us your review. We'd like some insight from outside perspective. And then the chain keeps moving. So I just want to say thanks for listening, Keith. That was awesome. Episode three, we're going to do these every Monday. Uh, episode three, we have a special guest in mind. And we're going to try to make sure that happens. And uh, we will be bringing you guys any updates as they come along. So as always, thanks for listening to Rough City, a couple of musicians sitting around talking music. Keith, have a good evening. You too, man. I'll talk to you soon. Late. Late.